themselves in glorious color. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Okay, the phone's vibrating. That means we're doing this. Two podcasts uh, recorded simultaneously through the magic of, I'm not sure what, it's Carcone Carne, presented by the Autobarn Mazda of Evanston. I'm James Van Osdell. As I'm recording Carcone Carne, as we're eating food from Big and Littles in Lakeview tonight, we're also recording... Make Us a Mixtape. Sponsored by no car company, so if you're a car company out there, or Mazda, we would love a car. Yes, I'm Paul Farvar. Marty DeRosa. We uh, had James Van Osdell make us a mixtape. And uh, they can only have five songs, which I know a lot of people have a hard time with. And you... Well, because it's bullshit. The most. You've had the most trouble. You've had trouble. the most trouble. We've never had uh, a podcast guest cause uh, or, or raise such... Uh, a lot of profanities were used. <laughs> calling us tyrants. The tyranny of your rules. We can't have a six-hour podcast. Can't you? Mm. All right, so we'll as, listen to that. as we're talking about this, yes. uh, this is where the podcasts commingle. Uh, every week on Car Con Carne, I and a guest or guests uh, eat and talk in the car. We do an interview as we eat. Uh, you guys chose this place, Big and Little. Yes. I've Marty been. I have. It's my favorite uh, neighborhood place to get very good uh, tacos and burgers uh, and the Merck's dog, which I got. Did anyone else get the Merck's dog? I got the shrimp po' boy okay. and Cajun fries. Okay, go. I got a burger and a taco, but yeah. I didn't get the dog. Very reliable tacos, decent price. And with uh, interesting meats, like yes. they have a, a gyro taco, and they've got all kinds of uh, interesting spins on pretty conventional food. Yeah. I, I want to try the burger because I, 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 I like to think I know where all the good burgers are in Chicago. What's your favorite place? Uh, I like Portillo's Burger. I really do. I think it's underrated. A lot of people uh, fight me. Um, it's a and cowards. It's a coward's move, Paul. It's not a it coward's is, move. It's a coward's move. Saying fight me or no, Portillo's? No, Portillo's. Nah, I think I, you know what? Saying it, saying it like a cheval is, I think, is is a is a sissy move. And I and and I, you already know, James, my burrito place because we did it mm -hmm. when we did uh, the show three before years ago. you had uh, this elaborate setup. When he this is very yeah, elaborate. This, I'm so impressed. Three years Thanks, ago, Marty. I just want a car to podcast in my car like this. This is all. I want to do. Three years ago, James had a Datsun 210. That's exactly and, right. And uh, we had those old tape recorders, and you were you were recording with a cassette tape. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how we got the idea for Make Us a Mixtape, to be honest. So. We stole it. We so stole explain it. the premise of Make Us a Mixtape. I guess it is self-explanatory. Marty? Uh, we have uh, our guest come in, and they make us a five-song mixtape, or, you know, a, a playlist. No one makes mixtapes anymore. Kids except, call it. Us except millennials call it We playlist. had a, uh, a guest on who uh, is a, a, a diehard Gen Xer, and he made us a actual CD yes. mix. It was amazing to see. Uh, I don't know where I'm going to play it. I haven't listened I'll to, have to it yet. Figure it out. Maybe my DVD player, I'm not sure. But we have people play them. Uh, they can be just my current five favorite songs, my all-time favorite songs. Any theme. It could be a, a narrative or whatever. And uh, it's interesting to sort of hear our friends' musical tastes, some good, some bad. Some, it's just like, what are these songs that you're playing on yeah. there? Yeah. Um, yeah, the levels of passion uh, for songs up and down. Some are just like, oh, it's just what I've listening to. And it's like, oh, I hear about them. I don't know, just Spotify or whatever. <laughs> and then other people are like, this band is my life. This saved my life. This was here when I needed them. Right. So it's kind of interesting to get the the whole span of uh, of our friends. Soundtracks some good, of some their bad lives. Taste, yeah, in music. Well, see, the, I I think the whole bad taste thing is almost BS because you know for years when we were young and vitriolic there was that idea that people had guilty pleasures like there are things you shouldn't like you should feel guilty about i think and maybe you guys don't agree but i think as we age the idea of a guilty pleasure kind of becomes silly and ludicrous that something isn't as like <coughs> people would argue that my love for rush constitutes a guilty pleasure they're wrong i love rush <laughs> okay i think that we're in this day and age now too where you're able to like what you like so much, you know, where in, in the day, like I love wrestling and in the day there are people who might've been like, well, I can't tell people I'm a wrestling fan, but now it's everybody, yeah. whatever everybody's into, they, they just like wear it so proudly. And I think with bands too, it's like, what, it, what is the, the bands you're supposed to be okay that you like and the bands you don't, I would rather have somebody who is obsessed with, you know, fish or whatever, or, or then somebody right. who's like, eh, music's whatever. Like I, I can't, fathom how people aren't passionate about music. Sure. Um, but we've had people on the podcast who were just kind of like, yeah, yeah. songs I like. And it's kind of like, wow. Well, yeah, how can you be how indifferent you to it? okay about music? 
that's the thing like even when you whatever art you're in like the one thing i rather someone hate my comedy or hate or you know love it but to be like indifferent like not memorable yeah that's kind of a that's kind of a crappy place to be but i will say that uh i agree with marty i think people there is no guilty pleasure anymore but there are people that should be shamed for some of their choices <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah, boy. Now, you could start eating. When you guys eat food, do you go with the thing you're going to like the most first or last? I usually start entree, then work my way around the sides, come back to the entree. I, don't, okay. I know some people will do one yeah, my cousin specific thing at a time. All of makes me nuts. And then moves on to I, the next thing. I do that too. I like to do. I don't like to mix flavors. So, but I like fries and burgers, I'll do it at the same time. But let the record show. I chose something that cannot be consumed in the car, let alone without any kind of silverware or. Yeah, that's a dangerous. Uh, what was I thinking? That feels like you take one bite and it's going to explode. I'm going to have to turn this into hand food. To which I'm like do. whittle my way down to to where I'm just at a bun. Uh, this is the shrimp po' boy, and it's it's hefty, and it smells really good too. Yeah. I got the. I'm gonna start with the Mexican um, short rib. I have the Japanese short rib, which is one of my uh, hangover favorites. <laughs> they also do like a fake Big Mac, which I love. And I thought back in the day when I was in like junior high, my idea was to open up a restaurant which had like fancy versions of fast food. Like I would mm-hmm. have like a fancy Big Mac and a fancy, you know, uh, like Crunch Wrap Supreme and stuff like that. And I feel like now that's kind of what I think I was ahead of my time. I never went to cooking school also. <laughs> but now there's a lot of places that are. Like, this place has, like, a fake... Well, not fake. Mm-hmm. It's, it's just the Big Mac, but it's better. I feel like that's a food challenge on every fifth Food Network show. Mm-hmm. Would pretty- that be your idea, Marty, where where you would be like... You would just go to McDonald's and just change the, the spread? So somebody told me there's a new thing where you, go, you can go to McDonald's and you order the Big Mac, but for the meat, you get the, the meat from the Quarter Pounder. And it has some name that I can't think of right now. It's a secret. But it's like a secret menu item. Huh. I love I love a quarter pounder. Yeah. I don't eat them that often. Yeah. Totally, I, I, I enjoy it every time I have it. I mean, the consistency. Mm-hmm. I, see, I was a Big Mac guy. I still am. I think if you're going to go to McDonald's, Big Mac's the way to go. What do you say is the big best burger in Chicago? Mm. I, I've never had a bad burger at Kuma's. Never. In fact... Kuma's is one of those places, I, I think it's always dependable. I, All I, of I them or a specific location? I mean, it's consistent. I mean, the, the menu is the same if you go to Vernon Hills, if you go to Schaumburg, probably Indianapolis. I'm going to trust that's true. Um, Kuma's is a place when tu- tourists or people from out of town come to Chicago and say, where can I go that's a Chicago place? It's not a touristy place. Really? I send them to Kuma's. I say Portillo's. No. Everything on the menu a, is so great. No, I like to go to Kuma's at like right before they close and no one's in there and you get your food real quick. Yeah. Um, I think every, you know, and I like uh, if you have to use the bathroom at, at um, Kuma's, the music is so loud, there's no judging. <laughs> and I think that they should play heavy metal in every bathroom. Everywhere, Agreed. So there's no judging at all when, mm-hmm. you're, when you're doing your thing. Yeah, Portillo's, I love it, but... Too touristy? Mm. I think that's a cop-out. Now, as far as places on, like, a Big and Littles level or kind of a neighborhood burger joint, I love Fatso's. I think I, that place is fantastic. Um, Paradise Pup and Des Plaines is delightful. I've heard about that place. I've never been. Mm-hmm. How are the cheeseburgers at Cheeseburger in Paradise? I've never been. <laughs> uh, not as good as Margaritaville. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Where's your burger place, Marnie? Uh, you know, remember how you said <laughs> Oshaval? Yeah. I kind of really like that place. <laughs> See? Yeah, I really like that place a lot. But it's like, one, I go there like once a year. I keep It's like a treat to me. I don't like having to wait too long for food. Yeah. And I don't like being on a wait list and killing time and watching people eat. I get antsy. Like, I just kind of want to go in and get served. Yeah, when there's too much, like, you know, like all the friends, they'll go to like the violet hour or something. I'm like, well, I want to wait and all that mm-hmm. stuff. Like, Big stars like that too. Like they're you sometimes you have to wait for their. It's just I'm like, how long does it take to just make a taco? It's good though. One exciting thing you'll get to experience as you edit this podcast for yourself. We don't edit. We just play it. <laughs> well, you get the the rich, bold, vibrant sounds of gentlemen eating on microphone. Yeah. <laughs> which you've not had up until this point. No. Um, 
I will tell you when you're editing or not editing at home listening in headphones it is delightful it's heartwarming people like it oh they love it yeah it's like the AMSR we had unbox we did some unboxing videos uh, me and a buddy and uh, for a, a wrestling kind of like monthly subsur- a monthly subscription service and uh, people said they enjoyed like hearing the cardboard rip and stuff with headphones it was very soothing so some people have uh, there's a, I forgot what it's called but uh, a fetish no the, <laughs> the opposite where people can't handle the people chewing because um, I had a segment sure. on WGN radio with Patty where um, they'd be like what is Paul eating and people would have to guess oh, what I'm right. eating I guess I that. oh right and so but certain people hated maybe the that's segment. hindering the growth of my podcast some people mm-hmm. I forgot it's a there's a it's a thing do people like seeing the food because this is the this is mm-hmm. my favorite item and this is like as little kid as it gets but this is just a hot dog with Merck's cheddar oh, on it oh wow which is like I will eat anything favorite. with Merck's cheddar yeah, on it it's my favorite anything it's so good mm-hmm. so mm. can we ask you about why you picked these five songs sure. I kind yeah, of figured it out it. Mm-hmm. how hard was it to put this list together <laughs> as hard as you made it out to be I hate it um, well why? first you Please sent us a list why. of 20 yes and we laughed well I didn't I didn't know there was a, a limit so the first thing I sent you was a list of 20 of my favorite songs. Okay. I listen to a lot of stuff. I, I am, sure. Musically, I'm never... For those of that don't know, James is a legend in the Chicago industry because we have followers not, in not, Argentina. It's not true, but I have been around for a while. <laughs> so I listen to a lot of stuff, and it's really hard. And, you know, it's cliche, but you know, my top 10 or top 20 songs could change tomorrow. It really just sure. depends on mood, environment, what I'm feeling, what I'm interested in. Uh, it, it doesn't change day by day. So I tried to give a real cross-section. I, I thought about eras, genres, uh, emotional <laughs> attachments. I yep. And I got that down to 20, and I was really proud of myself. And then I was denied. So <laughs> I'd still like the whole 20. We could post the whole 20. Yes. But it'll be uh, an extra. And some of the songs that were on the on the top five weren't in the original 20 though, right? Did you go a different direction? Different direction. That's so, what I figured. So I, I, I tried to think thematically and I was thinking um, top five obscure David Bowie songs. I grew up loving David Bowie. Oh, I wanted to go deep cuts on Bowie. Good. But I thought that wasn't quite where my head is at or who, I'm, who I am at this moment. Um, so I thought, what's a good representation of me, what I like, where my passion is? And it, comes, it always comes back to Chicago music. So I tried to distill decades of sound, styles, etc. from Chicago into five songs, which is really hard. And one thing, I, you know, I do a local music show on 101 WKQX, and I'm o- often asked to do album reviews or song reviews for bands, and I'm very careful to not do that. I'm very careful to not show bias or favoritism in some way to bands, because it's not fair as I'm trying to embrace all Chicago bands. So I went about this, I, I tried to find a band that is emblematic of the Chicago music I came to initially know, my, my entry point to Chicago music. Okay. Um, I My work with Chicago music started in the 1990s, and I tried to find an artist that was emblematic of the 90s and that scene. And Marty and I were talking about this before we started recording, this bonkers period in the 90s where everyone got a record deal. So I tried to find something that was representative of that. Um, and then I tried to find a couple modern examples of Chicago music where things might be going now. Not necessarily my favorites, things I really <coughs> like, but artists that are indicative of what the scene is doing now. And also one that's been around for a while but is still active in recording really, really good music. So that's it's, it's all about Chicago. But there's a lot of notable Chicago artists that are not on your list. Well, the, by design, list. you gave me okay. five slots. <laughs> if they made a movie about uh, the Chicago music scene in the 90s, who would you like to play you? <laughs> Nobody. I wouldn't want to be in Come that on, movie. You're the, you're, the, you're the narrator of this. Oh, if I'm the narrator. You're seeing it through your eyes. I, I Wow. I, excellent question, Marty. Thank you very much. Uh, what, what I've never given consideration to. Uh, we'll we'll circle back, as they say okay. in corporate America. Okay, I'll, cool. I'll, I'll, cool. I'll, I'll ping you later. Can we play the first song that you have on this list here? Yeah. So you put. We started with uh, "Treason" by Naked Raygun. First thing I noticed about that. Was, so let's play a little. <laughs> was really a band that was my tether into Chicago. 
Chicago music. When I was in high school, this was the band I understood as the Chicago band. They had that look. They had the leather cop coats with the, literally, cop coats with the Chicago flag patches. They had the black boots, the flat tops. Jeff Pizzotti, one of the most compelling front men you'll ever see uh, on stage in Chicago with his whoa, whoa, whoa. Everything about Raygun screamed cool. Everything about Raygun made me interested to learn more uh, about Chicago music and the bands and see the bands. So that song, Treason, which was a modest modestly successful single for, for them. But not their biggest song. Probably not. I mean, maybe Rat Patrol, but um, Treason to me was a real gateway gateway to Chicago music. And I, I can't talk about Chicago music without stating the importance of Naked Ray Gun. And it, it, echoes of Naked Ray Gun still can be heard in Chicago music. When did you first see him live? Probably post Haggerty. Probably 91. Where at? Metro. Metro. Yeah, yeah they're, they're definitely, like you said, in the, the like, especially the punk bands in Chicago, they're like the one that everybody listens to. You said the cop jackets, which you, I remember buying one at the alley. The oh, yeah, right, right down the street, right? right? Street, mm -hmm. And that was kind of just like, okay, this is what it is. And I think this is a great sign to start a mix also. Mm -hmm. It's like right out of the gate, we're like, okay, mm -hmm. did you think about that when you put the running order together? Come on, Dave. <laughs> so good. Yeah, it's a great, it's just a great song to start it off with. I used to uh, give old people hearing tests and uh, give them hearing aids back in the day. And one of my patients, uh, I cannot remember what role they were in the band, but she's like, you probably don't know them, but my son is in a band. And she's like, it's called Naked Rake. And I know you probably never heard of them, but of course I've heard of them. She was blown away that I had heard of them. And I was like... I have no, like, how would you not think that? They're huge. But it's funny. Guess, you know, punk bands sometimes fly under the radar in the, in the big world out there. I was uh, recording at Riot Fest all uh, two weekends ago. Out there all three days doing a bunch of interviews, which you can hear on carklincarney.com. I was wearing a ray gun shirt on the second day I was out there, which also happened to be the day I did the most interviews. 99% of the bands I talked to were like, ray gun, fucking love them, dude. Just, uh, everyone knows Naked yeah. Reagan. And the name. Is, the name is the best, too. The name is great, the best. What a great name. That's the best. That's like such a good name where it's like some bands you'll read like a you know biography on them or whatever and they're like, oh, we were originally called this and thank God it uh -huh. changed before we got huge or whatever. <laughs> but like for a punk band, like I remember as a kid being like Naked Reagan, like that just pops. That's just a great name for mm -hmm. me. And they always had the best like album covers or artwork or whatever. It was it kind of like... It was that, you know, Mad Max sort of like always kind of like this is punk, Mohawks and leather and stuff. And I was like, yeah, that's it. I remember them playing in Chicago. I never got into them or their, their style of music, but I did remember uh, first time I got like playing the Cubby Bear in the 90s was the ultimate. This is before House of Blues was because they even existed. Mm -hmm. And so they were, they used to play there all the time in the 90s, right? Their Metro. And I think uh, Dave Grohl talked about that the first time we saw. Dave, Dave Grohl. Everyone talks about that show. Dave Grohl has beaten that drum so many times. <laughs> He'll always tell the story about how he went to Cubby Bear and Ray Gun saved his life or changed his life. <laughs> I went right. to both Foo Fighters shows, excuse me, last summer. It's hard to eat a po' boy and talk about this. Went to both Ray Gun, or Ray Gun shows, Foo Fighters shows, shows at Wrigley last summer. Grohl had the same pattern down both nights. It was the same exact script, Rehearsed. which on a related note, if you're a big touring band, change your set list if you're playing the same city for multiple nights. the same set list both nights? Both nights. Uh, you got to mix that up because you've got to assume your real fans will probably find a way to go to both yeah, shows. Yeah, you would think so. You would think so. So not only was it the same set list, it was the same banter. I thought, okay, I'm not buying it anymore. Yeah. I, I, it's I, a great story, but I'm not feeling it because it's, it's so scripted. It's a weird thing with you know, like a celebrities or whatever. Like I love pro wrestling and I'll listen to these interviews by these mm -hmm. old guys all the time. And it's the same thing. They have the story down. They've told it a million mm -hmm. times. They know the beats. It's almost like stand up. Like they've got yeah. it all figured out and you hear them and you're just like the first time you're like, Oh, what a great story. Uh -huh. And then the next time I have her, then it's like, okay, man, you're just, you're just doing the hits. Like you, you start to wonder like, Oh, we're in Cleveland. I remember the first time I came to Cleveland, it's like, ah, oh, this is the Cleveland story. Here we go. Here we go. But yeah, I remember seeing that uh, Sonic Highways, either the one on Chicago. Same story. Yeah. Same story. Mm -hmm. I can't believe the same the same set list two nights in a row. 
Because you it's have to think diehards were there for both, and then I guess you Especially said, in the same city. Yeah, yeah, it was good. It was still good. Yeah. Change it up. Mm-hmm. What do you think of bands playing the whole album at a concert? I love album plays. I think it's a great idea. Yeah. I, I just did an interview, excuse me, with uh, Richard Patrick of the band Filter, and this year is the 20th anniversary of Filter's title of record album. The one that had to take a wow. picture. A big, big breakthrough success for them. And they're going to go on the road. Uh, this was just a one-off that Filter did. And they're going to go out on the road and do a 20th anniversary title of record tour where they play it start to finish. I like that. It just, it's it's exciting. It's yeah. An artist gets to present their complete vision start to finish. For ill or well, I you know we're uh, about two blocks away from the Vic. About a month ago, I saw Adam Ant play the Friend or Foe album, Start to Finish. And that was super cool, and I forgot, oh, there's some deep cuts in there that I really love. And just What's, What album was that one? Uh, Friend or Foe was the first solo album after the end, so that had um, Desperate But Not Serious, Goody Two Shoes, right, Crackpot right. History, and The Right to Lie. Okay. Mm-hmm. Oh. Yeah, we talked about before we started recording. Oh, I'm recording. sorry, I was, I'm trying to remember. What's that, Paul? No, I, I, I liked Adam Ant. He had a yeah. song, Beautiful, but that's way later, right? That was the 90s. Wonderful. Oh, yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. Sorry. All right, here's, <laughs> here's a situation I encountered at work. People either know Adam Ant in his glory and his new wave history, or they know him as the one-hit wonder from the 90s. Goody Two-Shoes. Well, Goody yeah. Two-Shoes was 80s, but you, if you know Wonderful, that was 1993, 1994. That was the comeback, kind of. That was, that was the comeback. But I found that a lot of people... Uh, Colleagues of mine had no idea that he even had a career before then, which makes me want to scream into the void. Because I love the Adam and the Ant stuff. I love that kind of Burundi drum stuff he had. I remember Ad, I remember Goody Two Shoes in that album in the eighties, but I didn't know Adam and the Ants. So uh, my challenge to you, Paul, <laughs> after you leave here tonight, homework. Homework. I want you to listen to the song Ant Music. What is it called? Ant, Ant music. music. I will. And we talked about too with. Hey, will he really do that? Uh, yeah, legally okay. he, he has to. Okay, good. Um, but we have talked about sort of the album is gone. Like now it's just you grab a song on it's, iTunes or Spotify or whatever. It's an a la carte culture. It yeah. really is. It's, it's different, it, which is a bummer for artists who create, who have this start to finish vision and people just cherry pick a song or two and yeah. never actually. That's why I like, I, I gave up on vinyl for a while, but I've come back to vinyl and I've beat this drum a lot on the podcast. I like listening to records. Because you're kind of locked in for 15, 20 minutes, you are locked into that artist's ideas or that, that that vision for that period of time. You can't fast forward. You can't just carelessly skip. You're you're keyed in. That's what I like about that. You're you are part of that world. Yeah, and I feel like it's just kind of like trust me. If the artist, you know, as the artist, just like trust me. This is the order of the songs. Yep. This is how it goes. I'm gonna big you up. I'm gonna bring you down. You know. And I think if if you do just have like one or two songs from somebody. It's tough to kind of really get a whole a whole idea of it. Sure. There are once in a while, like driving or if I'm walking on, I'll put on a whole album, and it is kind of like, especially when you get to the end, it almost feels like you accomplished something. Which, yeah. You know, you just listen to music. That's no big deal. But you sort of get the whole idea, and I like a good, you know, after a slower song, then a faster song oh, yeah. starts or something like that. And I love I love just kind of going on that ride. Totally agree. Well, that, I think that whole idea of bands caring about the album order it was after CDs because. People didn't even remember. They didn't know song names anymore. They'd right. be like number three, and I'm guilty of it too. Because well, sure. I would be like, "Wait, what's the name of that song?" Like number seven. Like I have that Adam Ant album, and I know Wonderful, but I, don't, I didn't even know the name because I, I I liked him. I liked that song, not the album, but the song. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that there is something to be said for those artists. What do you think killed um, the album? Do you think it was the record labels that were just like in a rush to just be like, wait, we just need one hit? No, I, I think it, it's digital everything. The, the ability to get things a la carte, whether it was file sharing or streaming now, albums are kind of outmoded. I mean, it's just... But before, a- before even digital, if you go back to the 90s, right? There were, there were artists that were putting out songs that only one they knew or they should have known I sound like a lawyer they knew or they should have <laughs> known that it was gonna people weren't gonna like the rest of the songs but they didn't care I think it, I, seems, like, it seems like an, a, an overstatement how many times did you buy an album and you're like oh I love this song and then you'd go home and it would it would be horrible I remember there were certain CD stores where you could listen to the album before sure. and they people would do that you'd pay a little more at that place but you know, as a risk and reward. Whereas you go to Best Buy or wherever, it was like nine ninety nine. You're like, sweet. 
then you'd buy The Farm. Remember the band The Farm? That's sure. a great example. They had that one song, Groovy Train or whatever. Uh, they had two. All Together Now was another hit. All Together Now, right. But that album was horrible. It was <laughs> but, a horrible I, album. I, and course, I remember that that turned me off. And I was like, and I remember I had seen a paper on why the record companies are getting killed. And this is when Napster or everything came out. It's because we almost, the record labels gave gave up on the consumer. They're like, you know what? We just want to, we just want to. Once to buy the album, we don't care anymore. I think that not the, all. I think that's an overstatement. I mean, <laughs> you're inevitably you're going to find albums that suck, that maybe have one or two shining moments, and mm -hmm. the rest is garbage. You could say that about any form of entertainment. Yeah, I really liked Breaking Bad as a TV show, but that Fly episode I thought was unwatchable, and that was garbage. It doesn't negate the fact that there was some good in there, but inevitably you're, you can watch a movie and say, "Man, I." I really love the uh, Between Two Ferns movie on Netflix. The stuff they did with the celebrities was really funny, but man, the narrative was really stupid and I kind of hated it. And It's not a good movie, but there are things I liked about it. So what's the third song on that farm series? <laughs> Listen, I, I get credit for knowing the second, so. That's impressive. Paul, mm -hmm. speaking of second songs. Oh yeah, let's wow. get to that. Let's Look at that. that. Dude, All right, you, so. That was very, thank you very, very radio. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, this one uh, is The Great Reactor by Blood People. It is. Can you feel me? Female vocals. She's got this great rap music. Whiskey soaked weather. Rock voice. Nice. I love it. Damn. Love it. Incredibly tight band. I've seen them live a couple times, most recently at Green Kitchen, which is that way of Um And they just they make the floor shake, they make the wall shake. She is so tight. Ellie's a friend of mine. I've known her for, for years. We, I put her through my music company and her soul. She's great. When you get Paul you just turn it We need that. Yeah, I like that. The hook's coming up. No, that's it. I, I, I liked. Did you ever listen to her when she had her solo? Stuff? I didn't. Okay. So how did you learn about this band? Uh, through my radio show. They so sent it, and then you could so you get you obviously hear local bands of you know not just local bands but all sorts of new bands and stuff like that. Sure. Uh, there have there had been some where you're like, oh boy, this is going to be huge, and then oh no, I, I I went through that in the '90s where I thought that about a lot of bands and was. Incredibly wrong. I, I don't assume that about anything anymore. anymore. You're just, yeah, I felt yeah. like in the 90s it was like stock market, like it was almost like playing stocks. Oh, yeah, and we'll, we'll get to that because there's an artist on this list that'll be a springboard for that. Um, but yeah, I, the calculus of what creates fame, what allows for an artist to go to that next level, I don't understand, especially in the modern day. Well, it's different now, but in the 90s, you kind of had your finger on the pulse in terms of knowing what artists were going to do well. And it wasn't just the music, but it was having good heads on their shoulders and mm -hmm. stuff like that too, right? Yeah, I mean, th there's a lot that, that went into it. I mean, I think, um, I just watched, uh, talking about the Filter show, Johnny Radke was playing guitar with Filter and he was in Kill Hannah back in the day. And I remember watching Kill Hannah and they seemed like they had the entire package. They really had a bandality about them, a, a look, a very clear image of who they are and what their they had a label was. Well, they put out all their stuff independently. They, they did a lot of things right, but there was a lot that went into it. And look and vision, I think, had a lot to do with it. Yeah. Above and beyond the music. I think some, that's you, savviness. Did you ever see uh, the movie Josie and the Pussycats? No. It's not a good movie. <laughs> no. Although people try to say it is a good movie, and they're like, it really talks about like, the 90s music and all this stuff or whatever, like going into the 2000s or whatever. But there's a scene where they're walking by, and the guy kind of pictures, like, that's the CD cover. Mm -hmm. And it is like you see certain bands, and you're just like, oh, man. Whoever, like, I remember seeing bands open for bands I went to see, and you're just like, oh, this, they've got it all. They've got, like, yeah. the look and the sound and everything. And you think, like, they'll be the next big thing. And I kind of think we've, we have gotten away from, there used to be, you know, like, Spin and Rolling Stone were sure. so important. Like alternative, all these music magazines were important. There were the radio was the, like was like the tastemaker. Yep. MTV was the tasteman. You know, and then I just felt like there were times where you would just get like bombarded. And you're like you wouldn't know a band, and then a week later you're like, oh, they were on this TV show. They were on Saturday Night Live. They were yeah. this. They were this, and they just like they, you were getting hit from like every 
platform. And you're like, I guess Filter's the new band now. Well, you're talking about something that I've hit on a few times on the podcast. That idea of curation. Mm -hmm. There was a very clear curation of music back then. I think now, the irony is, you can find whatever you want to on the internet. Every song, every artist, whatever you're looking for, it's there. The difference now is you don't know where to go or what specifically... Too many choices. Too many choices. Like Netflix, you can just scroll and scroll Too many scroll and choices, scroll. but not enough guidance as yeah. to where to go. I mean, I've, whether it's Spotify or Apple Music or Google Play Music, I find that the recommendation engines are not you all like that good. this. Yeah. They never... It's not good. They never nail it. And you would think algorithmically they'd be able to spit out a, a perfect array yeah. or, or list of artists for me to dig into. That's not the case. So, you know, radio for its various foibles back then was able to at least lob up a bunch of that stuff for oh, yeah. people to consider. Yeah. And, you know, to your point, it was in concert with the music press, you know, whether it was alternative press or Spin or Rolling Stone or whatever. Did you ever give anybody a bad review and they were, took it very personally? I was Did you very have a message left by Ryan Adams on you? <laughs> <laughs> no, I was always very careful to not. I mean, I might have said snarky things back in my younger days, um, but I, I tried not to be shitty about bands. I had, uh, I, I think I told Marty this story, but uh, Shisha and Boy Productions, we were a music company, we were a one stop shop for bands in the, for years. And uh, they would send us packages. There was a period of time where we had 10, 20 CDs a month. Sure. So we were managing, booking, everything. And there were a couple of bands that I never got, I never understood. But I, I when I was cleaning out my my uh, my room, I saw their stuff. And two of the bands that we were like, hey, we're going to pass on working with you guys, have ended up being the two biggest bands in Chicago, to come out of Chicago in recent years. I can say one of them because I, ta I talked to them about it, but Fall Out Boy was one of them. Mm. And... Uh, you know, sometimes you call them, sometimes you're wrong. Exactly. But I was never. The, I, but the funny thing is, is I have those emails where I said, you know, uh, you guys are really. I was never a dick or anything. But I. But I was like, yeah, I was very wrong. But I wouldn't know what to do with them either. And like we talked before, you know, Swizzle Swizzle Tree was a band that I, mm -hmm. I was friends with, and but I didn't understand it. But I knew they were talented. So. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, they were part of that whole scene. That yeah, was with the some of the bands we'll talk mm -hmm. about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's next? But <laughs> I do want to talk about Kill Hanny, though. That was a band that I thought was going to be huge. See, I mean, um, they came close. I mean, they, they really they got the, the Atlantic Records deal. Yeah. I remember back in the day, uh, this is probably 99 or 2000, Carson Daly called me because I was involved with, uh, at the time, Local 101 and Q101, and he had his own record label. And he wanted, wow. he wanted to get the skinny on Kill Hanny because he was thinking about signing them. And I, I, of course, talked them up. Then I hung up and I thought, that's about the weirdest thing that I, I've ever experienced <laughs> in my life. I, yeah. I was driving on Columbus Drive, and I'm on my cell phone, you know, of course, handheld as I was driving, uh, talking to Carson Daly about these guys who I've known for a couple years. Yeah. It was nuts. Who else were on his record label? Do you I don't even know. I, I, <coughs> I don't even I didn't, remember what the name of the label was. I didn't know he had a label, but it doesn't but yeah, surprise he, me. He, you know, before, I mean, what, but he was the, like, what, K-Rock? guy before he was MTV exactly K-Rock was always like the farm team for MTV and success yeah yeah, interesting the farm team I like that and now one not, of the not guys not the farm who created All Together Now <laughs> All Together Now the second that hit would have been perfect if that was your next song but unfortunately it's not <laughs> unfortunately it is. Oh, tell them what the next song is the next song is uh, my nose is running Bad Form by Gancer I've never did I say it right Gancer, Gancer yeah. I've never heard of this band uh, uh, Female Fronted Post-punk stuff, uh, angular. Sounds like you're walking into the bottle at like three o'clock in the morning. Yes, that's a big. Yeah, they're great. I, mean, I love this kind of artistic post-punk type vibe. I just played my best for you. Guitars are alive and well. I, talking about the way things are curated nowadays, nowadays um, there's a real focus on pop based material, but the majority of the stuff I get is guitar, bass, and drums, and some pr some permutation of that. This band rocks, but they're also experimental and artistic and cool. And I mean, I feel cooler listening to this. Just like it's just extra. It's just, to me, it just sounds like extra cool. 
there's, there's something vaguely sexual when you listen to this. Yeah. Yeah. There's just, and I, it's ironically charged. And you, like you mentioned, like I think there, you know, in every genre, there's always like, oh, it's the end of this, and there's no more this. But it's like you said, like there are people who are like, yeah, guitars are gone. It's all like trying. It's like no, no, no. no. First of all, a lot of those songs you have to have a guitar to write a lot of these songs to begin with. But like this music will never go out of style. There will always be like a fourteen-year-old kid who will hear this and just be like, I don't know what it is about guitar. this song, but I'm I I dig this. Uh-huh. And that and that, that to me is just like certain songs, you know, just they'll hit you and you'll be like, no, there's no way this form of music will go away to where it's all just going to be electronic music. This is not this is not possible. And so I, I included this just because this to me sounds exciting. This to me is just artistic and challenging in its own way. And it's just plain cool. How are they live? You seen them? Live? Yeah, they're great. Yeah, sounds like they'd be a good live band. Uh-huh. What time, where, where did they play on Ryan Fest? They played it. Uh, they played early, I forgot which stage, uh, I forgot the name of the stage. Uh, they played early on the third day. Okay. Right. And then I uh, did a show with them at House of Blues two years ago. And they're great. That's great. I like her voice. I think it's pretty cool. It's like, uh, not Courtney Barnett, but kind of like uh, monotone in some ways. You know what I mean? It's like a, it's got an edge to it. Definitely. How did you feel like with like a, a fest like Riot Fest where you have new bands, old bands? How do you sort of you split it up and try to make sure you see the new stuff as, as much as the old stuff? I do. I mean, it, it's hard. I mean, I, I find with Riot Fest there are a couple bands obviously you know you're going to plan to see. I, I find events like that much more fun if you kind of wing it and fall into stuff. And the more you try to regiment your weekend, the more stressful it becomes and the less fun it becomes. How do you, how do you feel like new bands can sort of stick out in like a, a setting like Riot Fest or, you know, Lollapalooza or whatever? Like how, what, what, you know, how do you... To, to be clear, I hate Lollapalooza. Oh, cool. Yeah. Why? It, really? Well, I, I, I want to hear your reasoning. But. I, because I'm over 18. Yeah. I, I don't... I, I was on the bus when all these p- people were coming back from Lollapalooza, and it made me feel so old. But I was like, no, but I would love it if I was 18. But, but now like, I'm just like, nah. I think I think the last two uh, two or three years on the lineups, they're trying to wean out the our generation of bands. But if you go back three or four years ago, uh, they had some really good bands that, that, that I thought would be... First of all, know, four days is too much. I Absolutely. agree with that. That was a stupid move on there. Two part. was enough. <laughs> it really Two's is. plenty. But there were so many, like, <coughs> I mean, uh, this year I didn't get to, this is the first year I haven't gone in years. And, and the only reason I go is because I, I, I like the backs, the VIP section. They, they, you have those bathrooms that are air conditioned. It's the most bougie <laughs> thing you'll hear on oh, this podcast. Yeah, they have a, open bars. Fun. And you get to, no, I actually like to be on stage with like the because a lot of the bands that I wanted to see when I'd go like three three years ago Strand of Oaks Strands of Oak and uh, I was right on the stage watching them and that's something that's surreal for me to see mm-hmm. a band that I really love and follow from the beginning and uh, those are the kind of things I like to see but I wanted to but the last three years I looked at the list I'm like I don't know I don't know any of these bands it's just it, it's it seems very narrowly focused genre wise I I can't abide by Ariana Ariana Grande. As a headliner, that's just a big yeah, main, was, mainstream pop crazy. festival. It's not, it's not for me. I did want to see Childish Gambino, though. I've never seen him live. So. Whenever I see like the <laughs> concert poster for like a tour, like a Lollapalooza festival, and they have like the big giant names, then they get a little smaller. Then uh-huh. I wonder the like back and forth of emails of like how big is our name? Oh, we oh, need to dude, be bigger. you know. I could only imagine like we have to be uh, above every time so I see so. that I'm like, oh, how is that name bigger than that? Well, name? and you have a band like Chevelle playing Lollapalooza. Oh yeah, you know. Fantastic standby band from the far north suburbs in this lineup that they really don't belong in. They, they were kind of this square peg round hole, this rock band, this accomplished, you know, gold record selling rock yeah. band in the middle of DJs and pop. And I don't know what the benefit is to Chevelle to be on that lineup. That where you probably aren't making new fans, and your actual fans don't want to go. Well, I think I, the same thing about. The, do you remember? I don't know if it was three or four years ago. They had the band Live, mm-hmm. and did you did you do you remember Live? Like, why do were I they on the Live? Do you remember the nineties? <laughs> remember the nineties? Yeah. Live was this. I mean, they were on the bill, and I remember seeing them. I was like, who, the, mm, how are they benefiting here? <laughs> Paul yeah, wants like, to raise his hand in between songs. I have a question. Uh, are I have you questions benefiting from this? 
It was. It was and like. Are you uh, gonna play Lakini's Juice? Yeah. <laughs> I wonder. Yeah, and, and I mean, because there's like comedy clubs or, or shows that we'll do as comedians, and you don't want to do it, but the money's good, so you do yeah, it, and exactly. you and a little part of you dies inside when you're on that stage, but you do it, and I'm sure that's how it is. Like if it's just like, hey, you got offered Lollapalooza, who knows? Maybe somebody who's buying the bands liked you and wants yeah. to book you, or hey, if you want Pop Princess, you also have to take. You know, live or something. That's like true. That. It could Who be knows? the same agency. But that yeah, it would kind of suck every day. You're just like, I'm well, not like Lollapalooza is on tour anymore. But if it was, like, to just be like, yeah, we play at eleven every day. Nobody really listens. <laughs> but then we watch other bands all you know, day. And it, it is different. There is, I mean, it, it's kind of cliche to pit the two against each other. But Riot Fest is so different, and I feel like there, there is a certain sameness and spirit of attendees that they will listen to, consume, and support the bands that they don't know. They're mm-hmm. excited to see. I don't know if that's true with Lollapalooza. And you know, going back to the, why don't I like Lollapalooza? I think one of the things that completely lost me was McCartney a couple years ago. Nothing against the Beatles. Nothing against McCartney. When they announced him as a headliner, I don't know what that festival is anymore. Yeah, I that's really, a weird... That was a weird, weird... I saw that. I was there for that show. I was like, ah, this doesn't make and sense. And I saw him you know, a couple years later at uh, Tinley Park, uh, Hollywood Casino Amphitheater. Thought he was great. That was the place to see McCartney. But it was funny because if you went to, did you see that show? When he no. Was, whoever was, I forgot who was playing on the other side. It was like Vampire Weekend or whatever. But because of the way he plays, you could hear it. Sure. Even being close up. But sometimes you wonder if it's they're like, we need our 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 fans should listen to this music. Like we're the curators. Mm-hmm. You're gonna come see the show. And when you tell your parents you're going, and there's this guy Paul McCartney, they're like, "Oh, you're gonna love it." But I think that completely flies in the face of like rock music, of like being like, "There's this old guy that's gonna play, and you're gonna love him." It's uh-huh. like, I don't think that's. It's weird. I do see those bills sometimes, and you're just like, "Sell me the why? <laughs> would I go to this? Uh-huh. Why are these bands or whatever?" And then others you see, and you're like, "That's perfect." But it is, it is interesting, you know. I have a kid in high school, very much into rock and metal. He was totally down for going to Riot Fest this year. He was excited about seeing the Who, the HU. Uh, Rise Against, Slayer, uh, a lot of the other bands. And I said, is anyone from your school going to Riot Fest? He's like, they don't even know Riot Fest exists. All they listen to is pop and country. Yeah. yeah. Which is, I mean, I remember when I was in high school, I remember when I was playing songs on the radio for people in high school. It was very different. Yeah, but it's it's so crazy how country has dominated that youth now because when we were when i was in school i know marty went to indiana so they had country but like in chicago nobody well we've covered this already right marty like yeah i but we nobody cool listened to country even but when the, garth brooks came out and it was like blowing up nobody but i think the country, country that james is talking about that it's the kids at your school it's just like it's just even pop. the country even country fans would be like that's not yeah. country it's like fast food country but it's, music. So, it's so popular so bad. But it's so. But you hear it. They have like you'll hear like a record scratch in the back, and there's like a <laughs> exactly. On, and it's just like this is no country. Shaggy's music. on this song. Anybody? Yeah, right, right. <laughs> like they'll have like a rap. You're gonna interlude with like a rapper or something like that. Like you're just like this is not exactly country music. And I I think it's just one of those things of just you know you you just like anybody how they came. You know, kids just like I'm in sixth grade and I listen to you know whatever the hippest band is or whatever it's like you listen to your bad music then you kind of get into the better music or whatever no i think in in high school the what you listen to shapes you significantly i think if you were listening to shitty music back then um it's gonna affect you you're gonna be a <laughs> shitty person when you get older those are the people that listen to limp biscuit they're that's but i i, mean, I, I know a lot of limp biscuit and I, I know i was not a shitty person i, <laughs> I, just I know a lot of, well with wrestling and i enjoyed it <laughs> I, I know a lot of recovering limp biscuit fans yeah <laughs> Well, that was a bad example. But my point is that, like, country, even in Chicago, talking about fest, the, the country fest, smoke fest or whatever, that thing is huge now. Yeah. It, when it first started here, I remember it was, like, one street, part of a street. Now it's, like, mm-hmm. it's taking over the city. And all these people, you know when it's in town because all these people come in there. Hey, right? Paul, speaking of what's taking over the city, our number four track. This band actually did take over the they city. They took over the city. Harpoon, AM Taxi. So AM Taxi, you mentioned Swizzle Tree earlier. There was that emergency in the late 90s from the suburbs, Devon's Grove, Naperville, by the Upper Coast, uh, Naperville, that whole area. Uh, they would bust their fans in, and they... To Metro and... 
the very first. Uh, and they, they built this following. They, would, they built a scene, basically. They, they bring their fans into the city. They, they made it so that they had an impact on the city. Lucky Boy's confusion was really the, the leader of that. Uh, Plain White Tees grew out of that scene. And Adam Pryor, uh, Lucky Boy's confusion, a couple years after Lucky Boy's broke, did his thing with American Taxi, AM Taxi, and they had their major label moment. And that was early aughts. This band is still going. They just put out an album called Shiver By Me, which is as good as anything you'll hear. This song is on there. This song is on there, Harpoon. Uh, this is as good as anything you'll hear. Like it. uh, it's kind of like Americana tinged punk rock. And I wanted to include this because Adam's kind of straddled a couple decades with Lucky Boys, with AM Taxi, and he's still making music I think is vital I, and I think is highly listenable. I saw the band at Reggie's a few months ago, and they were tight and great. great and wonderful. Yeah, it's a. This album, there, there's a handful of songs on there that I like and I've played on the radio. Uh, I can't recommend it enough. It's just nice. He's kind of become an elder statesman on the music scene now. But, uh, it's still making fantastic music. I remember when they, when he was in Lucky Boys. I mean, those guys, they would they put on these shows. Like you said, they would bust all these people. They're all from the Downers Grove area, west suburbs and whatever. And if you're a club owner and you see hundreds of kids coming to a show... You're gonna book that band again. Yeah. What was the Chicago? What did, would the Chicago bands talk shit on that? Would that be like, a, oh, they're gonna bring their fans in? Stuff I'm like sure that. they. I'm sure they. I would did. love because yeah. that is. I'm always thinking like my comedian brain is like, <laughs> when comedian I knew was busting people and be like, oh, look at this guy. Whatever. But it's genius. It's genius. It's a smart idea. A lot of bands still do that. They they have a big following in, in whatever suburb or we, there's people I, I, that are in Indiana that would, would bust people in town because they want to come to Chicago they, and they make it an event. To yeah, their exactly credit, right. they exactly would make right. it an event because they'd have all make sure all the other bands were good, and uh, it was a fun time. We'd have like Sunday Sunday shows, it was like all ages shows yeah. or whatever at Metro. Um, yeah, they're great. I I didn't get into the Lucky Boys until later in AM Taxi when they had members of bands that I used to manage. That's when I started listening yeah. to them and they, they got their album on vinyl. Album two. I, I've listened to this album tons this year. Again, I'm They're careful, great. This is a I'm great careful song. to not show bias as I talk about bands, but Ian Tex is just so great. They're and, great. Because you probably know a lot, of, like you said, a lot of these people from different band creations yeah. or whatever, and then finally sort of like, you know, like you said, becoming like an elder statesman or something. Yeah, well, so I knew people as like, oh, there's just like 18 year old kid from the Burbs who has this band, and now they're like, like this grown man who's been in multiple bands and still kind of going or whatever. Uh, a lot of people have turned to Adam for production help and advice and he's, he's kind of taken on a mentorship role in addition to still making great music and putting on great shows they it's still put on a, great shows you, man. that Reggie show is fantastic what's, I saw them what's the your fest. I mean I'm sure you've obviously you've been to a, a million concerts or whatever but is there any concert that just stuck out as like that was just a night I can't even believe like just an amazing lineup the vibe the venue everything just kind of clicked just in general a yeah, concert yeah. Uh, this is going to date me so be it um I've been doing this for a while. Beatles 57. Be <laughs> at the Cavern Club. Um, <laughs> best concert I ever saw was at Metro. Again, not far from here. 1988. It was Iggy Pop on the Instinct Tour. Wow. This was in the middle of one of those horrific heat waves in Chicago. One of those weeks where like the temperature never went lower than 100 degrees and you know, all the news stations were telling people to check on their elderly yeah, because yeah. It, you know the old people were dropping like flies in the heat. It was 10,000 degrees inside Metro. It was incredibly sold out. I had seen Iggy Pop for my first time maybe a year or two before. He was opening up for the Pretenders at the USC Pavilion. Wow. And that was that was my introduction to Iggy Pop. And mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I'm watching him on stage play Five Foot One and Search and Destroy and uh, every, you know, I Want to Be Your Dog. And it blew my mind. And I, w I wanted to make sure I saw him next time he came to town. And that album he put out, Instinct, was this very metal, very harder-edged album, very different uh, from the rest of his stuff, and it was fantastic. There were songs like uh, Squarehead on there, and the title track, uh, High On You, really good songs. I couldn't wait to see him. It was packed shoulder to shoulder in the middle of this heat, this bare-chested man who's all like sinew and bone <laughs> was winding his way on stage, and he is, I mean, when he comes out on stage, he, you're transfixed. You cannot take yeah. your eyes off this man. He's this physical Showman, marvel, yeah. if not curiosity. And these songs are just fucking anthems. They're just yeah. powerful and real and honest. And he's—I mean—he was a legend back in 1988. 
and just being in that room just felt really special and exciting and I felt like I could die at any minute because of this crush of people and the fact that the heat is oppressive and I've lost 10 pounds of water weight just standing here. <laughs> I, that I, I don't think a concert will ever be as memorable for me as that Iggy Pop show at Metro. Wow, that's so awesome. Were you in the? Oh, were you on the ground? I wasn't in the VIP back in 1980. No, I know, but they there was no upstairs. air conditioned bathrooms. You no air conditioned <laughs> bathroom. I'm out. You would have yeah. absolutely hated it. Um, no, were you? Were you in? Was that yeah. was like that was pre mosh pit? I think right. I, I don't know. No, 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 Paul. I thought the well, what do you call the it? The mosh pit started in Nirvana's uh, yeah. Public yeah. Conspiracy video. No, I thought so they no, served the whole thing, not. guys. I'm just a millennial. Uh, it, thing. Yeah, punk rock was uh, was pretty violent back in the day. That was that was before. Well, I, I guess I guess it's a semantic word. Before there was mosh pits, the way that like there's no moshing that were written on the tickets. Punk shows they would just beat the shit out of each other. Yeah, yeah. That's oh, they were like violent. But I didn't know they were the called mosh pits back in the day. <laughs> like the, everyone now thinks the Cubby Bear is just this like oh it's like a Cubs bar and they had like violent punk rock shows back in the day. No, my it's brother would go to those concerts. People don't realize, I mean, you go through Wrigleyville now, and mm -hmm. it, especially by Wrigley Field, it's this bucolic, lovely area. Back when we were kids, Wrigleyville wasn't that great of an area to be walking around in, not a great place for our parents right. to drop us off at, at Cabaret Metro. It was, you know, it was dicey. Yeah. Not the case anymore. I, I'd feel safe throwing a picnic at 3 o'clock in the morning on Waveland and Clark. Is the Metro your favorite local venue? I think it has to be. I, yeah. yeah. You know, I, I said this after I left the Filter show the other night. I, I tend to forget, but I don't forget. There's nothing like that. It is the quintessential rock club. It is our CBGBs. There, there are no bad sight lines at Metro. The sound is always great. And it's just... You walk into Metro and you feel like, I am connected with music. I, I, this, I'm here. This is home. I am, I'm, I'm in this. And you, you don't mind sitting through a bunch of opening bands. There are some venues where you feel the opening bands if you, if you don't love them. Like, the oh, venue. God, this is torturous. Yeah. Metro, it's just, there's that excitement. There's a physical something, a, a vibe that yeah. you feel when you walk in there. So there's nothing like Metro. Were you ever a Fireside Bowl guy? I, by the time Fireside was in full swing, I was too old for it. Oh, I mean, okay. it was. I went to a few Fireside shows, but I definitely felt I wasn't punk enough and I wasn't uh, young enough to go yeah, there. I was in the sweet spot for that, and it was just one of those where it's like, ooh, I got, I was in on that one, and uh -huh. it felt like those shows felt special. And you'll see the old, you know, documentaries of bands and footage yeah. from there, and you're just like, yep, that, that's it. Oh, you that's look at the bands that, that were booked there, and just shocking how mm -hmm. how quality those bands were. I mean. There are a lot of bands you've never heard from again, but sure. some really familiar names rolled through there. And the scary thing about Fireside, one of my most lasting memories is the bathroom is atrocious. Mm -hmm. That's really one of, my, one of my big takeaways. No air conditioning bathrooms like that's a lot right. of VIP. <laughs> that's right. No, but I, I think what you say about Metro is just the fact that there's so much history there. And, and my first concert at Metro in high school changed my life. To because then after I went to a concert there, I was like, <coughs> I never want to go to a big stadium show anymore. I didn't want to go yeah, to, I, get that. I didn't go to, I remember after that, anytime like a band went to like the World Theater or Poplar Creek, I'm like, I don't want to see that. I yeah. want to be in the shit experiencing <laughs> it. And it was, and I didn't listen to harder stuff either, but just the feeling of, like you said, there's no bad spot in that. Yeah, the, in certain venues. You stand right in front of the speaker, it hurts. Like, there, you're like, ah, eh, it's not that bad. Cause I you, just, so, wait, what was that show? It was the Connells. Okay. Do you remember the Connells? Uh, yeah. Was this like 1994 when Slackjaw was a single? Uh, no, it was before Slackjaw. It was Fun and Games 1992, 1991. Yeah. TVT Choose Records? Yeah. TVT Records, yeah. Mm -hmm. the, uh, what's the guy's name that ran that company? Cause um, they Steve had a, Gottlieb. Yeah, Steve Gottlieb. Mm -hmm. He's still around. He's doing stuff in uh, L.A. Yeah, well, I, I interviewed for a job with CBT in the nineties. They had some good uh, bands on that label. They, they, they yeah, they did. <laughs> no, I, I, I remember that. Uh, I, I, I was in contact with them later in life. But yeah, that, that, that Connell show. Then I saw the Connells a bunch of times mm -hmm. after that. One of my favorite bands. But I just thought about seeing this. Like I've never seen a band at the Metro that wasn't like you're gonna get wild at this show like it would be kind of wild to see like Mellow a singer show? songwriter like yeah. an acoustic like show there like every show I've went to and I remember like the first time I went there you like you hear the opening band playing as you go up the stairs yeah yeah it's just that like it starts with like and then when you get in it's just like ah it's full sound and everything and I'll like I never forget those 
And one of the cool things when I would start, you know, I grew up in Indiana, but I come to Chicago for concerts. And as you were watching the show, you would like look around and be like, that's that dude from that band. Oh yeah. She's oh, from that yeah. band. And our last performer was one who, whenever he was at a show, I would be like so excited to see him. And that's Wesley Willis. Uh, whenever he would be at a show in the crowd or whatever, like everybody would go up. It was just like. Did you get headbutted by him ever? I never got headbutted. I wish I did. Of course. <laughs> but it was just like seeing him at shows would be like. Oh, this yeah. is this. That to me felt like I'm in Chicago. You're like I'm like, gonna like, leave yeah. my farm in yeah, Indiana. That's the equivalent of like the move the in L.A. when a celebrity drives by and someone goes, "Wow, L.A." Like to me, that was like, "Wow, Chicago." West Wales right. just walked through this bar. Absolutely right. Venue. Mm-hmm. He's such a Chicago icon. We should just go right into it. Um, I want to play this, but I want to play the intro because I think it's really. For the people who don't know who Wesley Willis is, it's important. This is Jesus is the Answer by Wesley Willis. The last Technically, song. This, this is the Wesley Willis fiasco. This is him with his full rock band. Oh, this right. is different. After from, he got... Um, go ahead, sorry. Uh, different from what a lot of people have come to know Wesley for, that uh, singing along with this pre-programmed Casio track, he had a full band of Chicago musicians. This album came out, I think, in 1993. Um... Yeah, I don't know. Sounds right. Well, if is this when Rick Rubin got involved? No, this somehow? is long before Rick Rubin. Okay, all right. This is uh, Jesus is the answer. The, f- the intro says it all. Let's see. This is the song that I'm going to be singing to you, which is called Jesus is the Answer. Number one, I'm gonna do this song again. Number two, I'm gonna do this song again all the way up your ass. And number three, I'm gonna fuck your ass up like in a car crash. And number four. I'm gonna fuck you up like a goddamn accident. And number five, Jesus is the answer. This is the song that I'm going to wrap up with the song, Jesus is the answer. Jesus oh, Wesley. So, to wrap up this five song playlist of Chicago music, Wesley Wills to me is symbolic of what the Chicago music scene was in the 1990s. You, uh, the decade started with a couple of very high profile major label signings. Liz Fair, Smashing Pumpkins, Urge Overkill. Those signings were significant enough that Billboard magazine, looking for the next Seattle, uh, famously dubbed Chicago the cutting edge's new capital. Mm-hmm. The second that happened, uh, A&R, artists and repertoire uh, people from record companies around America started like vultures circling around our city, circling around our clubs. They got like a sore thumb at these shows. Kind of. Yeah. Um, but they were searching for the next Urge Overkill, the next Liz Fair. And so bands were getting record deals left and right. Some bands deserving, some bands maybe not. Some bands who were very ready, some bands who definitely were not ready. But in that signing frenzy, we saw bands like Peruka Salt, Smoking Popes, uh, Triple Fast Action, Loud Lucy, The Pulsars, all these bands getting deals from Chicago. And there was, even the Jesus Lizard had a major label moment. Love the Jesus Lizard. If we had room for 10 songs, I'd probably include Glamorous. In all of that, just symbolic of how everyone got a deal, Wesley Willis got a deal, and we started to explain who he is. Here was um, Wesley was the six foot five mountain of a man, African American man, diagnosed schizophrenic. He was a very familiar fixture, as Marty said, in Chicago clubs. You'd see him sitting on the stairs, leading upstairs to Metro, doing these elaborate pen and ink drawings of the city of Chicago, just from his from mind's memory. eye, from memory. I have, I have one hanging on my wall at home. It's one of my oh, no prized possession, prized possessions. Uh, he would draw these beautiful Chicago s- cityscapes, and he just wa- he loved music. That was his escape. He had a rough childhood. I think. He, had a, he had a very rough childhood. One of the projects, a lot of foster home thing, and he had certain Wesleyisms. Uh, if, he, if he wanted to be his friend, he had to accept a headbutt from him. <laughs> yes. And I've, I've taken many a headbutt from Wesley. I, I had him at the radio station a bunch of times back in the day. And I'll never forget, uh, this is back in the Q101 days, we did an annual Christmas show called Twisted. Um, yeah. The second year we did it, we did it at the Rosemont Horizon all State Arena. And I was supposed to do a stage announcement. I was supposed to introduce, it was either Tripping Daisy or the Goo Goo Dolls. And I invited Wesley Willis to do the stage announcement with me. Oh, so cool. Uh, which he did. But beforehand, I remember the people from Jam Productions, who were the concert promoter, freaking out because Wesley was just... You never know. You never know. Uh, and I, I remember distinctly, Porno for Pyros uh, were on the bill that year, uh, Perry Farrell, Jane's Addictions Band. And I remember Wesley, before we went on stage, asking Perry Farrell backstage if he wanted to buy one of his CDs. <laughs> 
Because so, Wesley was always selling these self-produced CDs. I don't know how many in total he created. Um, I will say there is a James Van Ossel song in one of the CDs. Nice. Oh, it's, that, that's it. I'm done. That, There's that's a documentary on him going around all the record yeah. stores selling, selling selling his album to yeah. them to sell yeah. or whatever. And it's just the whole process. You know, he put every, he did everything himself. And it was so cool. And I love those, like... I mean, every. I mean, he's such a unique individual. But a lot of music scenes have their, you know, like, like how uh, Daniel Johnson just passed away. And there's just cer there's a certain thing about those unique musicians that everybody kind of like rallies yeah. around, and and they're just like, they're just so. It's just so awesome to see uh, someone like that who has all his issues and uh, you know the mental illness and things like that. But in spite of it all, he found this world of like you know sort of underground music or whatever that accepted him, and he became this like cult hero where he would just yeah. walk into a place and everybody would just like lose their minds well there, there was this ongoing dialogue through the 90s is Wesley being exploited sure and fair question I the way I tended to look at it was if people were taking care of him taking care of him taking him home taking him home at night and letting him do stuff that he likes mm -hmm. and why does it matter right and I don't maybe some people were laughing at him I dearly hope not but um, Wesley was happy when he was playing his music he was happy and people were supporting him. i thought well fuck that's probably as good as it can get for wesley willis who is so mentally distressed i mean so heavily medicated this is where he gets his joy from right. fucking great i think people were attracted to him at least from my experience from my what i would argue is that he brought out the purity and like enjoying life for what it is and the innocence of just you could see him just being him and, yeah. he, and and people would watch him and, and sadly he passed away in the early 2000s uh, early 2000s but yeah. during the 90s uh, Jello Biafra uh, from the Dead Kennedys put out some of his uh, solo recorded music mm -hmm. and then Rick Rubin on his American Records label put out I, I think just one uh, Wesley album but I mean really the Wesley Willis albums are those that he self-produced right. you know all the songs are about either local bands or really foul and vulgar things involving zoo animals like suck a hyena, hyena's dick um, and what would, if you've never heard a Wesley Willis song he ended every song with a commercial slogan yeah for a lot of local businesses and, and national too yeah he, he just like, it was he would great. parrot it was he would great. parrot their, their, their taglines and it was just awesome you knew when the song was ending you were going to get one of those uh, but before you got that you'd get the rock over London yep. rock on Chicago which that's it. That's Chicago in the '90s. Rock over London. Rock on Chicago. So cool. That so that's why I wanted to close the playlist with that. I mean, yeah, makes Wesley sense. Willis represents the most bonkers and at the same time kind of wonderful side of Chicago music. And that, to me, it's it's hard to distill all the good and all the fun and all the greatness that I heard and saw in the 1990s. Wesley kind of is the best way I can do that. Yeah. So like you, you personify for me. Uh, the 90s scene in Chicago because that's when I was listening to music mm -hmm. and getting into the scene and watching all these bands and and I was when I saw that you're like uh, I, I saw that you had to cut down the list I was like all right he's doing Chicago bands but then I was like there's a lot of Chicago bands that he did not include on this list <laughs> a lot well sure I mean I would have loved to have been, you know I mentioned the Jesus Lizard 11th Dream Day would have been another one I would have included I mean a really important band uh late 80s, early 90s, through the 90s, really. Plenty of bands on Bloodshot, plenty of bands yeah. that got signed that we mentioned. Uh, so much great punk music. You know, my friends in 88 Fingers Louie and the Bull Weevils contributed amazing stuff during that period. But, you know, I, I had one song, basically. <laughs> well, what, uh, did you used to make people mixtapes when you were, uh, when you were a kid? Yeah, back in high school. What were they? So, what, 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 when would you make these tapes? When? Were they like to try to? Were you trying to to win over women? Were your no. friends asking you to well, do if, it? Well, if I was breakups, it was, it was, not, breakups. It was not successful. Okay. In, in high school, um, no, I, I really made them more than anything for myself, for me to listen to when I was driving around in my car. I would have, you know, a handful of cassettes ready to go in the glove box. Old school, and, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so really, they were for my. I would, you know, sit there with my stereo. I'd have my cassette deck, and I'd Dual keep up the records, of course. Um, but really, I was recording mostly off vinyl, so, and then a later CD. But I was just making content for myself, really. Were there were, so like Marty make, gives me a lot of shit <coughs> because I I used to make people 
a mixtape. So I, I found all these cassettes from the 90s, actual cassettes of ones I made for people or that were made for me. And I made one at one point on a CD. It was like after I broke up with somebody. He gave somebody a breakup. And that was so controversial Very on this weird. tape. Wait, wait, you... So we broke up, but we had all these moments together. It was a it was a healthy relationship. This is when I was older. I was in my late twenties, early thirties. I gave her a, a mixtape, and it was like a that's weird, know, right? Yeah, that's very weird. <laughs> Thank you, James. Thank you. Like it is weird. One hundred percent with everybody thinking that's very weird. That when it's over, it's over. Like you, yeah. you can't. That's that's the end. So the, my picture was like okay, but I I it's you know you have to be remembered. Like you talk about indifference. We talked about that earlier. This is one of those things. Like, hey, I want to, I want to be remembered. He wanted, he wanted her to play that. And <laughs> go, oh, Paul. What no, a guy. I pictured a guy I mean, sitting in the car with her and be like, wow, this is a really good disc. That's a sweet Charday song. I... <laughs> there was actually a lot of new pornographers. I think was on that one, but I digress. Yeah, the, you, you, when the relationship is over, you, you can't go. That's, that's the equivalent of sending flowers. Yeah. It, it Maybe creepier. Yeah, it's Agreed weird. Move, Paul. Disagree. Yeah, weird real, move. Real huh. personal, real weird. I still, <laughs> I still stand by that that's one of the weirder things I've ever heard you do. And so, uh, don't do that if you're listening. <laughs> don't do that. Don't make anybody. Well, else. no one. They don't. The, people make playlists now. I'm they sure do. there's like a breakup playlist out sure. there. Someone's made. Um, I think it's healthier than than other actions people might take when they're on, upset. So it's like a, uh, it's I would like say a I therapy. Would say drinking is probably better. <laughs> I don't know. So, car con carne. Uh, you guys eat all your food? Yeah. Oh, I, I, feel, I ate the shit out of that. Time. Really, really good food. I saved my Cajun fries. That'll be my treat for the ride home. You're, you're a lot more disciplined than we are. I, I'm not. I, I wolfed down the uh, po' boy as best I could, but I knew I had to do a lot of talking, so I didn't allow no, myself. You- you, uh, you're impressive. I, I just can't believe what you've done with the place since in just this, this little time <laughs> since I last did it. I, uh, I remember, like I said, you know, there were there were none of these things. I didn't ever. I don't think I had a microphone last time. I think we were talking into like phones or something. I don't know. Must be nice, very Mazda. Uh-huh. Very impressive. The setup uh, is awesome. This is better than what we have set up, and we have a we have a studio, high high end <laughs> studio. <laughs> Where Marty and I record our mix, very high our mixtape. Uh, I think from now on, I just want to do crossover podcasts. That's fun. Yeah, it just, I feel like we only got to do our stuff. I feel like we didn't. We didn't get. To I got about, to talk about music for an hour. That's 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 on brand. Do you ever get sick of talking about music? No. No. Okay, good answer. <laughs> I, I just. I, it's funny that. Uh, when you had to make the mix, I was like, I was very curious just to see, and and we had a couple of people that were like really big music fans, but you're you're clearly the biggest music fan we know as music fans ourselves. And if I had to make a five song mixtape, like I I think it would be very very hard. And that's why I just went with, well, what what is symbolic of me? Like I kind of took myself out of, I took my personal stuff out of, it and just here's what I've been representing and supporting for the past. X amount of years. Next time we want to have your five songs that you would put on a breakup mix. <laughs> I think that's that's what we need to hear. I, I think for a breakup mix, it's fucking angry, right? It's just angry, like aggressive. Like, stuff. You're gonna miss me when I'm gone. Those <laughs> those are the best songs. If you were a complete lunatic and made somebody a breakup mix, it would be songs like, "Yeah, you're gonna miss me when I'm gone. I'm I'm better off." I yeah, I, I have no use even. for like a breakup mix that has like Hozier on it. Like, sure. <laughs> fucking give me. I don't know, throbbing gristle or something just intense and driving. I I, my, I would be it would be sadness songs and I and I made a mixtape for myself. You are emo. Yeah, I'm I'm more emo. If emo is around, I'm pre emo. Paul's somewhere between adult con, adult contemporary AC. and emo. You know what I mean? I think that's what Paul's. Counting Crows. That's Counting uh, Crows that's was my Paul's. jam. Oh. Buffalo Tom. Paul's I don't know if I remember, do you like Buffalo, Buffalo Tom? Buffalo Tom's one of my favorites. Uh, Counting Crows, you know, that's a guilty pleasure. You say, I love Rush, though. So, kind of boy. Uh, I hate the Counting Crows, but I do love <laughs> Buffalo Tom. I hate the Counting Crows. There's a lot of people that forget how great Buffalo Tom was. And, and, oh, my uh, God. There's a lot of secret. Chicago uh, was a good market for them. I got great to see them live. Uh, Nick DiGiulio was a big Buffalo mm-hmm. Tom fan. From WGN Radio. Um, yeah, there's a lot of people that when I remember coming to see, when they came back at Double Door, Maybe five or six years ago. Maybe it's longer now. But it was funny looking around the room and be like, oh, you know who they are? Because a lot of people don't know who they are. Uh, if you're listening to this, watching this, um, a couple songs I'd recommend. Um, Enemy is fantastic. Um, oh, 
Larry is my favorite song. What was it? Uh, Taillights Fade. Taillights Fade, God. number two on that album. Yeah. Let just, Me Come Over is the album you want to get. Yeah. I, I would say, yeah, there's a lot to explore there. Bill Janovitz, lead singer. Yeah. A uh, really talented vocalist, worth checking out. Absolutely. Did you know who they were, Marty? Yeah, they were on an episode of My So Called Life. So, of course, I knew who they were. That's amazing. <laughs> this generation z -er. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Uh, James, thank you so much yeah. for uh, for doing the show. Really appreciate this and uh, talking music, man. This is this was very cool. Yeah, because I learned a lot. Championed, uh, you know, bands that aren't the biggest and the best. I think that's uh, very cool. As a comedian, you hope that people, you know, champion the underdog instead of just oh, stand up like Seinfeld at the giant theater. It's like oh, well, there's other places to see comedy. And I know we're wrapping up, but there are a lot of parallels between comedy and music mm -hmm. on an independent level. I mean, a lot of the same grind, a lot of the same hustle, a lot oh, of yeah. the same highs and lows. I mean, I, I see it on both sides. So yeah, I, I do get that. And I, I know it's not easy for you guys. Yeah, and it's but it's the, you know, I think a lot of times you when it's there's just nothing cooler than seeing somebody before everybody else knows about oh, that. Oh, for sure. Oh, just that's like, the this greatest is thing here. This is a special show. Actually, the only thing cooler is rubbing it in. Yes, <laughs> yeah, I like them before you Which knew Which is them. why we do what we do, and we go to the shows <laughs> we go to, and we listen to the music we listen to, so we can go, oh, you like them? Well, you should probably hear this band instead. You know, they're the better version of that. That's exactly. Or I, I always, we talk about this in the podcast, too, when someone goes, like, do you know why you like that? It's kind of like, what? Like, you know, you're telling me why I like a band or something like that. Well, that goes back to the Naked Ray Gun. A lot of people were, were the, are influenced by yeah. them that... Later, like Blink-182 actually talks about them, I think, right? Everybody, yeah. every punk band talks yeah. about them. You have to. Not the Counting Crows. Not the Counting <laughs> no. Crows. No, you don't see a lot of uh, new bands wearing Counting Crows t-shirts to get, you know. I know you don't like them, but if you, you have to admit that at the time, no. <laughs> they were the biggest thing. No. Uh, <laughs> before Kurt Cobain passed away. No, uh, that, that first uh, album, August and Everything After, it came out in 1993. They were not the biggest thing. They were successful. They were not the biggest thing in 1993. You know what was the biggest thing that year? Pearl Jam Versus, which debuted at number one with a million oh, copies right. in its first week. That was the biggest thing that year. Not the kind mm -hmm, of gross. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Fuck you and round here. Well, <laughs> yeah, Q101 didn't, Go back didn't to say, Omaha. Didn't have, Q101 didn't have billboards that said round here. <laughs> Everyone listens to alternative music. Where can people uh, Where can people find out more about uh, you and your podcast, James? Uh, Car Con Carne. C-O-N is in Spanish for with. Carne is in Spanish for meat. KirklandCarney.com, also on you know, Facebook, Instagram, etc. Uh, the podcast is available on all platforms. There's also a YouTube channel if you want to watch videos like this. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for coming on. And uh, for all you guys listening, uh, our podcast is Make Us a Mixtape, available everywhere you podcast. And if you want to uh, make us a mixtape or have any questions, concerns, or reviews, or have your own take on Counting Crows or Buffalo Tom, mm -hmm. Uh, it's uh, paulmartymix at gmail.com. Hit us up. That's it. That's a wrap. A little ASMR for the road. <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys. Thank, Thank you. Thank you.